Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. My guest today is John Blacksland, who is a professor of international security and intelligence studies and former head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. John holds a PhD in War Studies from the Royal Military College of Canada, a Master of Arts in History from the Australian National University, and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of New South Wales. He's also a graduate of the Royal Thai Army Command and Staff College and the Royal Military College Duntroon. Prior to his academic pursuits, John enjoyed an extensive career as an intelligence officer in the Australian Army. Some of his career highlights include serving as the Principal Intelligence Staff Officer for the Australian Infantry Brigade deployed to East Timor in September 1999, being an Intelligence Exchange Officer in Washington, D.C., working as Director of Joint Intelligence Operations at Headquarters Joint Operations Command, as well as serving as Australia's Defence Attaché to Thailand and Myanmar. Throughout his career, John has published an extensive list of books, some of which include The U.S.-Thai Alliance and Asian International Relations, History, Memory and Future Developments, Niche Wars, Australia and Afghanistan and Iraq, 2001 to 2014, a book which we'll certainly discuss today. In From the Cold, Reflections on Australia's Korean War, 1950 to 1953, a geostrategic SWOT analysis for Australia, The Secret Cold War, the official history of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, East Timor Intervention, the protest years, and many more. John, it is a real pleasure to host you on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. Maz, thanks very much. Great to be with you. Before we delve... Like, you missed, you missed my, the book I'm most proud of, which is The Australian Army from Whitlam to Howard, uh, which is the, my, my only Cambridge book. But it's like uh, I, it's one people... It's because it's, I think it's because it's a Cambridge book. It's, it's a bit more expensive than usual. It's not a free download, so people haven't read it. I reckon it's my best, best work. Really, I do. Uh, you know what? I'm going to put a link in the notes. Just for that book. <laughs> Thank <you>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, before we delve into some of the kind of pressing security concerns that you are uh, wrestling with and, and are quite vocal about and also have uh, kind of a social commentary on, maybe we can start with a little bit about your background because yours is certainly very interesting. You were in the Army for many years, uh, so maybe we can start there. When did you join the Army and uh, what motivated that decision back then? Yeah, 24th of January, 8.30am, uh, 1983. Not that I remember specifically. <laughs> we all do, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Signed on the dotted line and I yeah. got on a bus at the recruiting centre in downtown Sydney near Central Station and we rode down to Canberra to uh, be a cadet at Duntroon for four years. Uh, hadn't quite appreciated what I was getting myself into. <laughs> yeah. none, none of us really have. When we get yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, I, there's no uh, immediate family connection with the army. The closest relative was a great uncle who died in the First World War. I, but I, for some reason, I really wanted to join. Um, but I also wanted to get a degree. And I knew that I, I didn't want to go the, the, the short route. I wanted to go the long route. And... Um, so the degree mattered to me because I figured I wasn't sure how long I was going to stay in the army, but I knew I wanted to challenge my brain a bit and I wanted to, I loved scholarship. So that meant that when I went to Duntroon, I was, I was not one of those people who were, who viewed, you know, 51% wasted effort, and 49% wasted year. I was like, I wanted HDs. I wanted, I wanted high distinctions. I wanted to top the class. And uh, I don't know what, what, what was driving me to do that, but uh, here I am, you know. Yeah, and I guess uh, academia set the tone for you as well uh, for your future. Uh, so you did you? Uh, I, I mentioned in the bio that you were an intelligence officer. Did you graduate into the intelligence corps, or did you? Uh, I did. I did. I graduated into intelligence corps, and then I went to ADFA, and I was mentored by uh, now professor, then lieutenant colonel, Dr. David Horner, who's a, you know, Australia's preeminent military historian. I was very, very fortunate to have him as my mentor. And he steered me towards a study on Australian military history. And I wrote my, my first paper was on the Pentropic organisation of the late of, uh, early 60s, late late 50s, early 60s, called Organising an Army, which was fortunately for me uh, published by the centre I'm, I'm at at the moment, the Strategic and Defence Study Centre. And that kind of 
got me fired up. I then wanted, I then did my Reggie time in the Signals Corps, and I was allocated to the Satellite Terminal Troop. And I thought well, that was a bit of a funny one because I thought, well, you know, it's a bit of a pogue kind of posting. Yeah. It turned out, um, but um, but it was really a blessing in disguise because I had time to, to volunteer to write the Signals Corps history. So I started down that path, and also it, the the satellite terminal troop was the, the the ground link for the satellite system connected to then DSD, which is in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So I got my first top secret security clearance, and I got this alphabet soup of clearances. And I'm thinking, I didn't know what had just happened to me, to be honest, man. Yeah. You know, I, just, I knew it. Somebody said you can't talk about it, and you can't take any notes. And I think, <laughs> well, that's a good thing because I can't remember what it just said. To me. <laughs> And you're, and you're trying to write the history. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I slowly started piecing things together because somebody said, oh, John, you might want to read Des Ball's stuff. You know, he's written a couple of really interesting books about SIGINT. And I thought, oh, okay, I started reading it. And then uh, then the penny started dropping um, about how it all hung together. And that was very influential as I was writing the Signals Core history, and, of course, which includes a little bit of SIGINT in there. Um, <laughs> as it happened, years later... Years later, I ran into Des. The first time I met Des Ball was actually in Thailand when I was defence attaché. And the Thai intelligence, my Thai intelligence interlocutors, invited me out for dinner with Des Ball. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute. How come you guys are inviting me, yeah. not me? How does that work? <laughs> I'm in Bangkok. Right? Anyway, it turns out he's his best friends with the Thai intelligence people because he's been working very closely with them on monitoring the Burmese so it's very, very interesting. Right. But it gave you a very early, I guess, introduction into um, into the murky waters of intelligence and the multiple crossovers, who's, who speaks to whom. Yeah, no, it really, it was a blessing in disguise because I really felt a little bit cheated because I wasn't going to, an, uh, to a field, you know, then a field unit and I wasn't, uh, it just, it seemed like I, I was a little bit disadvantaged. Um, and but as it turns out, because in, in my in my class, my graduating class, no one actually went to infantry. Um, there was a, a seemed to be a surplus of infantry, so they didn't want anybody from in, uh, from in corps. So quite a few of us went to signals. And uh, as I say, it's a blessing in disguise because uh, I'm really not a terribly technical person. But what I realised was that signals is one of those areas that non-technical people just can't get their heads around, so they leave it to the techies. Uh, whereas actually it's, it's actually really important for the non-tech people to work on getting the heads around. And that's what I tried to do when I wrote the book, The Signals, The uh, Swift and Sure, A History of the Signals Corps from 1947 to 1972. So post-World War II through to the end of Vietnam. And that and then, then got me on a roll, mate, as I said, I wanted to then write more books, you know. So, and that was all part-time while I was doing, you know, a, a, a job at DIO and then a, a job as an instructor at Duntroon, a job at Land Headquarters, and now a forces command, um, and and you know, then various jobs along the way. Was writing in your family? Um, my dad had an interest in history uh, and military history, and so he kept me supplied with a stock of, of books. And there was a tenuous link to Field Marshal Montgomery. Uh, my father is on the father's side. There's a Montgomery link going way back. It's a fairly tenuous link, but anyway, he's kept me supplied with the path to leadership and memoirs of Monty and, you know, so I kind of was, you know, steeped in uh, particularly World War II uh, British military history from Monty's perspective and then started reading more into the Australian side of things as I went along. Mm. And one of your career highlights is that you were the intelligence officer, when we, the principal intelligence officer in East Timor in 99. How did, that was extraordinary, yeah. you know, because yeah. I was just finishing up at Staff College in Thailand when I got a call from the career advisor saying, John, we're going to post you to, to Townsville. I'm thinking, well, that's a long way from Strat Communications in Melbourne, isn't it? That's, that's, quite, a, that's quite a stretch. So I'm thinking, oh, look, that's a good challenge. It'll be good. It'll be good fun. I mean, 3 Brigade doesn't ever deploy anywhere, but, you know, um, so I'll be sitting in barracks the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. But it'll be an interesting posting and, uh, you know, probably some teams will get deployed out doing something somewhere. And, uh, you know, you, you can't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I thought, well, Townsville, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Well, you can write another book. Well, I didn't have time to write another book. <laughs> plus. I, had to, uh, I had my tail hanging out. But interestingly, I arrived up there and then Brigadier Peter Lay, 
says to me, uh, why do I need you? Um, I thought, oh, really? That's an interesting question. Um, and, uh, you know, he, in his career, uh, a peacetime post-Vietnam army, uh, intelligence had not featured all that prominently. And, of course, I joined the brigade just as things start getting really, really interesting. Um, we've got troops in Bougainville. Um, the, we, things turn pear-shaped in Indonesia. We prepare for a possible uh, services protected evacuation operation. We then start planning for, you know, things start getting heated in East Timor. John Howard writes a letter to, to Habibi, the president of Indonesia, who took over from Suharto because he has been overthrown after the Asian financial crisis. So things are starting to bubble away. And uh, and then, so Peter Lay uh, uh, moves on to be promoted and goes on to bigger and better things. Uh, and then Brigadier Mark Evans comes in and he's just completed, I think he just completed CDSS at the College of Defence and Strategic Studies at Western on promotion of Brigadier. And he says, John, I think, I think we need to focus on a couple of things. And uh, I think we need to focus on the Solomon Islands, PNG, obviously, and I think we're going to have to focus on Timor. And uh, I said, Sir, no problems, happy to oblige. Uh, so we then focused on those three things. But as time went on, we focused more and more on East Timor. Um, and, of course, we were then told not to plan to go to East Timor. So Mark Evans, in his wisdom, says, right, hey, John, we're not planning to go to East Timor. We're planning to go to Orange Land. It just happened to look like Timor. <laughs> <laughs> so then we were planning. To, and what I, I, had a, I had a ball with my team. I had now a uh, captain... Navy Captain uh, Dean Commons, I had Steve Dixon, I had a whole swag of really competent people working with me, and we were pulling basically this kind of extended IPB on uh, the terrain, the culture, the history, the language, and we're pulling it together over most of uh, 1999 because we figured, look, so this is going to go pear-shaped uh, in some way, shape or form, and chances are we're going to be the bunnies having to do something about it. And so the preparation work we did, you know, uh, trying to figure out all the roads, the groupings, the cultures, the, and as, as time went on, the militia groups too, who's who in the zoo, who is resourcing them, how that worked, and trying to get the head around that and, and try and brief the, the brigade commander and the, and the uh, chief, uh, you know, commanders of the, of the units in the brigade about that. It was quite an adventure, quite an adventure. And then, of course, Pinnacle, of course, was actually deploying. Uh, and putting all this stuff that I, you know, all the training that we've done at, at Canungra over the years that seemed kind of quaint and esoteric on one level, here I was putting it into practice. Like, dang, this is this is awesome. This is this was it was it was an absolutely pinnacle experience working with top notch uh, team, uh, all you know, very competent, very confident in their abilities. Uh, collaboratively, you know, we work together to deliver a service to the brigade commander and to the brigade, and then working with the the, the support units, the, the 162 Recce Squadron, particularly really good uh, uh, support, working closely with the deployed uh, human and, and EW debts uh, with the infantry battalions, working with the PSYOPs teams and the PR people on messaging, and, you know, it was really, you know, this kind of classic end of course CPX buzz but over a prolonged period and I and I'm still dining out on it man so there you go yeah and so you should because I think uh I speak for many people certainly you your impact on that operation has echoed through the ages I've certainly found out about your performance uh in that job well before I ever uh, looked at any of the books that you've written, uh, I've heard about it through the course. So uh, congratulations on that. Thank you, man. Well, as and I say, man, I was covered. Uh, my many inadequacies were covered by some excellent team members, uh, and I've mentioned a couple of them. But there was it was really a team job, um, and uh, they made me look good, uh, and they made the core look good. You know, it yeah. was uh, it was a it was proof of the quality of, and the efficacy of the training that we went through it delivered and it was it was actually a, a buzz just to to know that you were part of that and that the system was working that way yeah and i guess that whole operation is uh, goes down in in certain history of australian army as a success um, perhaps not as much interesting though, as much. yeah yeah because you know what interesting you, my colleague here at the SDSC made the point that it was actually a strategic failure it's kind of it and when i first heard that i thought that's 
it's a bit jarring. It doesn't fit with my experience because my experience was this awesome experience of, you know, of the team reads being thrilled that we were there. Yet the only complaint was, why didn't you come sooner? You know, not why did you come, but why not earlier? Uh, which is, of course, the big question, which it was an international politics question. But Hugh makes the point that it was a strategic failure. Why? And I said, what do you mean? And, and he was saying, well, essentially, when John Howard wrote the letter to Habibi, it was never meant to be for independence. It was meant to be for some kind of Matignon accord, like French had done for New Caledonia, to basically put off the, the, the ambitions for independence and ameliorate their concerns. And that, of course, blew up because Habibi, being mercurial as he is, uh, kind of he uh, he he took he went into a bit of a uh, a bit of a funk and, and decided to lay down the gauntlet say no 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 we're going to have a referendum and it's going to be in or out so oh he's, of course that was then we then had UNAMET a UN assistance mission East Timor unarmed observers the bravest of people I'll have to say police uh, defence force members people uh, uh, you know who really were very very brave uh, in very very trying circumstances doing Australia proud, uh, um, who predated my time with, uh, you know, going there armed and with, you know, thousands of people around me and me sitting in, in, the, in the headquarters, uh, you know, basically not living nearly as dangerously as, as some people had done during the UNIMET time. Yeah. You made the point that you were really well prepared during the, um, your planning and that you focused on the culture and the tribal influences. How much did that reflect reality on the ground and how valuable was that lesson to take with you as an intelligence officer coming back uh, and also for our core to really embrace the importance of understanding the human terrain? Yeah. Um, so it would you'd have to ask people who were the recipients of our products uh, how they viewed that. But my sense is that they were overwhelmingly uh, happy with the support they got and with the material that we provided them. But the appetite was voracious. So we could never give them enough. There was always something more that we that people were said, why didn't you tell us about this? Or how come I didn't know about this? Well, you know, it was really uncharted, literally and metaphorically, uncharted territory for us. We hadn't really given it any much thought since World War II. And in fact, a lot of the material, you know, when we were digging up material to share with people to, about what it's like there was from the Second World War, mm. <laughs> you know, went back that far because there hadn't been that much. Under uh, the Portuguese, they hadn't really paid it much attention. We hadn't paid it much attention either. Um, and, of course, under the Indonesians, we weren't really all that welcome to do very much in East Timor. And we kind of left it to them to run, uh, to be fair. So it was a bit of a black hole. Uh, and it was one that, over time, we slowly filled the gaps. And, you know, as I said, it was an iterative process of getting a bit more information, dribs and drabs, on various bits on the culture, on the geography, on the on the demography, on, on the language. And we'd feed it mm -hmm. out to the, to the various units in the brigade along the way. But it was demonstrably valuable and it did speak to the importance of doing that ground research and and, and it valid you know uh then brigadier peter lay now professor peter lay and and i are actually on very good terms uh because his appreciation for the importance of intelligence went through the roof thereafter mm. and so that's i mean I guess the proof's in the pudding you know yeah, and, and, and I'll bring in some of his perspectives from uh, Niche Wars, from his chapter, um, because he certainly, drew, as, as the former Chief of Army, he certainly drew some important lessons. Uh, perhaps this, this is one that's uh, weaved into that narrative, at least. Um, but how do you think, or to what extent do you think that our collective experience in East Timor set us up for success for our then subsequent or, you know, concurrent wars, arguably, uh, in the case of Afghanistan. Um, how did it set us up for success or failure uh, in the Middle East? So I think there's a distinction to be made between the tactical and operational successes and the strategic level. And one of the points we make in the book Niche Wars is that Australia did not buy in at the strategic level in shaping the purpose, the narrative, the rationale, the mission. And that was the case in Iraq and Afghanistan, unfortunately. Uh, and so despite the valiant professional efforts of many, many people, 
over two decades in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's not that much to show for it there today because of the strategic rationale, the strategic direction provision was lacking. Um, and and Australia, Australia's political leaders and its senior military leaders were, I think, a little bit too cynical by half in thinking that we were making a contribution for the purpose of the alliance and therefore the next priority was keeping everybody alive, which is fair enough, but if you're putting people in harm's way, it's not enough to say that the mission's accomplished by getting the Dutch into a Roskam and us into NATO. That's just not good enough. And I guess that's uh, kind of where I was going with, with this kind of uh, that question because I've, uh, I must admit I haven't read the whole book, only uh, five or six chapters of Niche Wars and, and highly recommend it. But it, I get the sense that it's a deeply reflective book um, and the authors of the various chapters really try to be candid about the experiences. And we're talking from, you know, senior uh, defence leaders or even ministers who are writing their reflections on those wars. When you sat down to think about this book or to write it or to ask or to, you know, be one of the editors for it and to seek uh, contributions for various authors, what drove, what motivated that book in the first place? So one of the things that motivated it was the friendship I had with Colonel Marcus Fielding. Marcus was the S3 of 3 Brigade in 1999 and 2000. Um, And he and I became very close friends through that bonding experience of preparing for, deploying, and then conducting operations in East Timor. So we collaborated, and he has established the Military History and Heritage in Victoria, uh, an organisation that, uh, a non-for-profit group that does focus on military history. We ran the conference together uh, for, that led to the book East Timor Intervention, uh, Reflections on Interfet published by Melbourne University Press in 2015, uh, and we were doing a repeat effort essentially with uh, niche wars, or what we, well, the conference we called was uh, War in the Sandpit, and it was, it had, you know, the lineup of, of speakers that are in the book, minus one or two and plus one or two uh, that we picked, that we came along. And, uh, but Marcus has been the driving force in at MHHV in, and, Marcus and I sat down and we worked through who would who we would have and how it would be arranged to cover off on many, as many aspects, uh, much like with the East Timor intervention book, as many aspects of the of the operation from the strategic down to the tactical, to give a rounded perspective on not just the army perspective or the navy and the air force, but the civilian aid, federal police, uh, DFAT strategic policy perspectives to complement our understanding of what the hell we were doing there and why. Um, but getting back to your earlier point, Maz, I want to—I didn't finish off properly. Um, you asked me about the importance of the experience in East Timor in setting us up for uh, East Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't think there's any question that the, the experience of uh, conducting intelligence support to operations in East Timor in 99-2000, had a uh, completely energising effect on the core and on the professionalism of the core, which was a professional body already, but was inexperienced. I remember going on my ROAC, Original Officer Advanced Course at Canungra, had a blinder of a time. It was a great time, catching up with old friends and uh, learning a few new things. Uh, but there was, this is in, it was in 1990. Seven, no, 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 90, 96, 96, early 96, that's right. And back then it just seemed like, well, the good old days of the unipolar moment are going to last forever, you know, so there's nothing really going on. So we're doing this to go through the motions, you know, so we're practising kind of pr- procedures for major operations and we're thinking, well, when on earth is that ever going to happen, you know? And lo and behold, you know, only a couple of years later, there, as I say, we're actually, they're doing it for real. Um, and, of course, we then have two decades of doing it for real uh, that is uh, energised by the East Timor experience, as well as the experience in Bougainville and then the Solomon Islands as well. So we have, um, you know, a, a, a core element of, 
of experienced professionals in the in the core, in the intelligence core, who are uh, understand the needing and the need to work collaboratively with with the with the then engineers, the survey people, with the signals core people in the EW domain, um, and with everybody else in the sharing in in the sharing of collection, and in the and then and then of course we do the processing and and, and then, then disseminating, but then facilitating the dissemination. So you know, I look back. I look back at my, my training and on the ROBC that was then the Reg Regimental Officer Basic Course, uh, what's now IDIC and DIRAC, and you know the Intro to, to Defence Intelligence Course and the Defence in, uh, Intelligence Research and Analysis Course. For those who may not know those acronyms, um, uh, is the centrality of understanding the intelligence cycle and how the various components of that cycle apply. Um, it's just uh, amazing how the, the enduring utility of an understanding of the intelligence cycle and the components of it and how they function and how they interact and interrelate. Um, and it, it, it informs my teaching here at ANU today, the, honey, the course I teach now, Honeypots and Overcoats, Australian Intelligence in the World. I have a lot of fun teaching that, you know, drawing on, on, on the lessons I learned along the way, plus uh, the fun I had writing about ASIO and other intelligence bodies uh, mm. subsequently. And I guess this is a, and I've, spoke, I've had a number of guests that have spoken about this professionalism at the tactical level and the uh, training that we all on the go is, is, is exceptional. Um, and, and most other militaries say that about Australian uh, forces, Australian Defence Force writ large. It's got better since, since the days that I was doing it too. Um, and that's yeah. informed by the feedback, the learning loops, you know, that that uh, that the deployments uh, abroad have uh, helped generate. Hmm. I, I guess the, the point I was going to make or the question I was going to ask is that, so for example, I had uh, Harry Moffat, who's a, you know, you've probably heard of him. He's a bit of an SAS hero um, recently on the podcast. I also had uh, Major General Roger Noble on the podcast. And, and in many ways, they've both echoed what you just you know, said a minute ago about the you know, strategy being misaligned or there's an absence of strategy, regardless of how well the jobs are being performed on the ground. Ultimately, if the strategy, strategy if there is no strategy or if it's not one that uh, we can shape and control, I think it will be part of the problem rather than the solution. And I guess that's, the, that, that's also what really echoes strongly, at least in the chapters that I read about, uh, that I read in wars. Um, how honestly are we reflecting on that point? Do you feel at the moment? Um, so, I, one of the joys I had with working on that niche wars project was writing the introduction and conclusion, and trying to distill a so what in the final remarks at the end of the conclusion. And one of the things that strikes me is that. While the professionalism and the honing of the forces is, is, is acknowledged uh, from the experience in the Middle East, the key lesson, I believe, that needs to be learned that I don't think has yet been learned is the need for courageous and visionary thinking through the implications of force options that are put before government for them to consider. And that is something that when it came to operations in the Middle East, in what we call the niche wars, where we were making niche contributions to wars led by others, we didn't buy in on the strategy, uh, regretfully. Was that a choice? Yes, it was definitely a choice. Um, it was a choice, I think, uh, made in, it was calculated choice because we didn't want to have too much of a role because we didn't want to have too much of an exposure because we didn't want to have too many casualties. Um, and I think this is probably, you know, one of the uh, perhaps one of the wrong lessons from the Vietnam War experience that uh, there was a sense that, you know, casualties from the Vietnam War led to the politicisation of Australia's involvement in that war. I actually think it had more to do with our uh, uh, in, involvement of conscription and you know a, a, a choice that it, it's debatable but my sense is it could have been avoided by making uh, incentivizing voluntary service 
and that effort, that that kind of idea wasn't really explored adequately in my view, uh, but an incentivized voluntary service could have mitigated uh, some of the negative effects of conscription on society. Um, uh, so, but just getting back to the uh, the, the implications from the, the lessons from the, the niche wars, we, you know, the Prime Minister, successive Prime Ministers, John Howard started this off, very carefully calculated uh, and reckoned that the, the level of support that Australia needed to provide to, to support the United States, mindful that the United States was experiencing its unipolar moment and didn't physically need us to do the job it wanted to do. But we should have been more critical in our thinking about American strategy formulation, mindful not so much of the experience of the 1991 Gulf War, but of the previous major war, which was the Vietnam War. And we know there that that was just not seriously thought through, not adequately thought. It was seriously thought through, but not adequately thought through uh, because of a, uh, you know, part of that was the not doing the kind of work that intelligence officers should be doing, and that is uh, not uh, mirror imaging your, your expectations of how a war is going to go onto how your adversary thinks it might go. Um, and mirror imaging is, is, is one of the fatal flaws of intelligence analysis. Uh, you can't afford to have, you know, formulate your own assessments on an assumption that your adversary thinks the way you do, because mm. they don't. And that's a really important point. Um, and Australia's um, not very good, you know. I, I, there's a line I like to use occasionally is for Australians are barely monolingual, you know, we don't speak English mm. very well. Uh, and we're not culturally attuned all that well to our neighbours either. And and we can sometimes come across as a bit haughty, and that's it's incidental. Some people are quite hum, uh, humble and, and, and respectful, and others just aren't. Um, and uh, that there's a real area of room for improvement for us as we think about what our strategy might be of looking to, and, and here's the point, mate, this is all not just some esoteric point about the past because we're not going back to Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, the view would, might hold. The point is really for what the future might hold. And when we think about what the future might hold, it potentially involves us making much more existential choices in our own neighbourhood. And for that, we really do need to have a much deeper understanding of the culture of the, of the, of the way our potential partners and potential adversaries might view the world. And at the moment, we're starting from a low base, I would argue. Hmm. I mean, that's music to my ears, really, to hear you say that. Uh, I mentioned previously offline, I'm deeply involved in teaching a number of courses that really try to bring that point to light. Do we really need to spend more time understanding the ecosystems and i'll use that word because yeah. it's alive um it's a it, there there are multiple stakeholders that exist within each of these areas of operation uh, and one of the things that stands out i think about afghanistan is is that we certainly didn't understand that and you know to go to, back to the point that you know the enemy doesn't do what you think the enemy is going to do I think another point there is that the enemy is not necessarily who you think the enemy is. Right. Um, and I think that's – and as a, 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 while I sleep easy at night, and I've said this previously on my podcast, um, I was certainly part of uh, that push, you know, where we embraced a certain narrative and anybody that looked at us wrong, anybody that might have, you know, carried a piece of IED yeah. uh, was the Taliban. That's – and that certainly wasn't true because we certainly didn't understand that, hey, it's about potentially survival. There's a whole bunch of other social dynamics that we just didn't appreciate. We just reinforced a simple black and white narrative. Uh, you know, you're either with us or you're against us. And part of that was because we weren't sufficiently invested in winning. We weren't there to win. Uh, we were there to... Well, I guess what was the victory even? What, what, how did we, did we even define victory? Well, that's right. I mean, argue, you know, my friend and colleague, Al Palazzo, would argue that we were successful because we, the, the, the point of the mission was to boost the alliance. I would put, the, uh, my counterpoint is that actually the alliance is damaged because America's been damaged. America's spent trillions of dollars not building a BRI or not investing in American infrastructure, but on you know, pouring money and blood and treasure into the sands of the Middle East. 
little to show for it. Uh, so mm. on that front, I don't think Australia was a good ally. Australia actually, Australia wasn't successful because the United States is no longer in a strong, a stronger position to to provide the kind of security guarantee that we've always looked to it for. And, and so that, from that point of view, I think it's actually been quite quite harmful. And part of that is because we didn't buy in on the strategy. Now, I'm not saying it would have made a huge difference, but had we bought in more on the strategy, had we been prepared to put some elbow grease in. Now, this is when I was at, I had a short stint at the then Land Warfare Study Centre, now the Australian Army Research Centre, ARC, it's called now. Uh, but I wrote a little monograph called Revisiting Counterinsurgency. This is back in early 2006. And I remember back then thinking, look, there are lessons from our experience in Vietnam uh, that might be applied, applicable as we're going back into, into Afghanistan to, to do reconstruction as we were planning to do in Aruzgan province that we could possibly apply. But there was no appetite in Canberra, in the, uh, in the senior military and political levels for a, for a holistic attempt to, to be successful in Aruzgan. We weren't there to do that. Uh, as I say, it was it was much more constrained. It was about waving, showing the flag, making a, a, a contribution, but a but a, a contribution that wasn't about making sure that Uruk's gun was successful. Now, what happened though was that our soldiers and uh, and, and our, our ADF people, when they went there, you know, because they're professional, because they've got standards, they've got ethical compasses, they want to make a difference. They went there thinking we can make a difference. We are we're Australians. We're we, we're the ADF and we're the Army. We can do something constructive here, and literally and f- physically and metaphorically constructive, which is what uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Mick Ryan, you know, with the first Reconstruction Task Force, tried to do. Um, but if you're not backed up with a strategy that's about following through on that and delivering on that, you're really you're just pushing it uphill. And this this goes to you know explain why Karen Middleton's chapter on the media in in the book Niche Wars is so significant as well. Why was the media so constrained? Uh, it's not so constrained with the Canadians or the Brits or the Americans. It's constrained because we're kind of a little bit embarrassed. We don't want people to really know how constrained our force posture is or how constrained our mission scope is. So yes, it was successful. Uh, you know, in terms of supporting the US alliance. Yes, I was successful in keeping casualties low. And here's where I, I disagree a little bit with uh, Hugh Pote, who's Robert Pote's father, who wrote a book, Failures of Command, which is a really, it's an important book, don't get me wrong. But and he's critical of some some command decisions that were fault, faulty, no question. And, and the people involved have acknowledged that they were faulty. But it's in the context where the mission was very constrained and where we only lost 41 people there. Now, we've lost hundreds subsequently from, from PTSD, I know that. But the this is, you know, when you have a mission that is focused on just being there and coming home alive, there are, something's got to give. And, and I think I think the manifestation of PTSD is one of those things that's given uh, along the way. You know, there are there are those who would argue that there are those that would argue that uh, in fact uh, PTSD, or, uh, in term, amongst veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq, is is not that particularly higher in level than than it was for veterans of the First or Second World War. Uh, I, I I don't know the answer to that. I, I suspect I suspect it's probably not quite right, but it is. You know, warfare is shocking and it does induce trauma. And so that is not that surprising on one level, but it is, I think, accentuated by the fact of the, there was a real moral ambiguity about what we were doing and why. Um, and that did not help. And I guess that's a really important point and one I think um, General Peter Lay makes in the uh, argument or in the chapter of his book as well is that, you know, he, he acknowledges the importance of the alliance uh, to the US, but, you know, was it worth it? And I guess when we also superimpose on top of that, that ultimately none of us went to fight a war that we thought we were fighting. Yeah. Um, and that's the reality, right? So that's, well, so, so 
where do, you know, which point do we start drawing the line and reassessing how we even go to war, our decision making process to go to war? And I think Minister Robert Hill in, in the same book makes the point, you know, that he had no military background. He had an environmental portfolio, environmental portfolio before then became defense minister. Um, do, do they understand enough of the cost of war to be able to make those decisions, you know, arguably in support of something that is, you know, now, with hindsight, rather questionable. Yeah, well, there's a really interesting, the, the tension between the chapter written by then Lieutenant Colonel Tony Changi Rawlings on his experience in Almathana in Iraq and the chapter by Major General Mick Crane uh, as Commander Joint Task Force 633 uh, and the, the kind of, it's like water and oil, you know. It's like mm. it's just a polar opposite views. Changi's trying to... Uh, He's trying to do something in the ground, on the ground in Almathana that's positive, that's not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs behind the barbed wire. And so he's wanting to respond positively to invitations from the Brits and from the, from the other partners in the area uh, and feeling extremely frustrated, as are all his subordinates in the unit, mm. who are chafing at the bit to do something, you know, Get out of the barrack, get out of the compound, and patrol. Meet with the locals. Do something. Do something with their hands, you know. Um, and the other view of uh, General Crane, who's got very tight marching orders, black and white interpretation of the rules, and who rides Changi pretty tightly. And you get the, get the tension in the two chapters. It's very interesting the dynamics, which speaks to this this kind of uh, you know this irreconcilable dialectic of, of the Australian soldier wanting to go and do something for good, for you know, with a with a real sense of wanting to make a contribution and uh, much more uh, the politically savvy, uh, attuned to the government's direction commander of the JTF who says, no, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and again, it's a yeah, that's a very very interesting point because it is a it is a real dynamic and a tension that I think we ought to explore some more as well, and perhaps even as military officers, we need to unpack that, that you know, and and talk about it because it is so real. Um, and one of the things that we, I, I don't want to say we forget, but because we are so operationally focused and so. Um, focused on achieving the job uh, even in the absence of a mission will create a mission like you said because that's the Australian soldier you know it's it is about doing what you can while you're there uh, but reflecting on the on the on that vacuum I think is is truly important and I think if we can maybe pivot now to again to our region because I think um, you, you've made a very interesting point that we perhaps don't know our region well enough and I've again maybe I'm slightly biased I've been out of defense for a number of years of invested a lot of time into studying the importance of culture and intercultural communication. I've been to Iraq as a consultant and I've seen, again, the post, post the violent conflict industrial complex, mm -hmm. uh, which is another beast on its own. Yeah. Um, and also how much we really misunderstand what actually happens on the ground. Um, I've echoed this very question to a number of defense seniors who I won't call out, uh, <laughs> publicly, but, uh, many of my friends will, uh, will laugh at that point because, uh, because I have been quite vocal about, particularly about the region, that we don't have systematic, uh, institutionalized effort to really understand the region. It's very much, and I'll quote some of those seniors, it's over to you. <laughs> you know, speak to your counterparts who you're meeting on courses, uh, which to me is, uh, again, not necessarily really getting the point. Well, part of the issue there, mate, is that we have valued, um, you know, we've, we've been playing, uh, my the metaphor I like is playing primary school soccer. <clears throat> the, the fullback doesn't stay in position when the ball. <laughs> <up> the <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, everyone chases everyone the ball. Everyone chases yeah. the ball. And, 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 and in the army, you know, if you've got a thrusting bone in your body, you'll want a Guernsey. You want a deployment, right? Mm. And and if the good deployments are in the Middle East, then who cares about learning Indonesian or Pidgin or Tagalog or Thai or Tetum? You know, really, who who cares? That's not going to get you a gong. It's not going to get you a command. It's not going to get you a, a promotion. And and this is the skewering effect of our involvement in the Middle East for the last two decades. We've dropped the ball on our own patch. So who here is invested in Southeast, Southeast Asia or the Pacific, 
very few people. Uh, I, it's, you know, I, I lecture occasionally at Staff College, and the last time I was there, I asked how many Australians in the audience spoke Bahasa Indonesia. One hand. Mm. It's like, really? One? Yeah. That's yeah. shocking. Uh, I said, you know, if we if this was in the UK, at the UK Staff College, and we asked how many people spoke French, if your hand didn't go up, it would be embarrassing, right? So we are so under-invested in the relationship with our neighbours. And Indonesia is a classic. You know, we have been playing a game of snakes and ladders when it comes to Indonesia. Once One or two steps up the ladder and then down the snake we come over beef, boats, spies, clemency, mm. Timor, Papua, Jerusalem, mm. you name it. We've poked them in the eye of a range of things. We haven't stopped to ask them what they think or how they feel. And we forget that this is a country 10 times our population on a trajectory of economic growth that's set to eclipse us in our lifetimes. Um, <laughs> and that's culturally quite different. And with whom it is in our interests to get on well with. But you wouldn't know it by the way we're so cavalier about literally and metaphorically flying it over it on our way to somewhere else. And the same goes for some of the other neighbours in, 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 our, in our regions, in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. You know, and, and look, for a long time, while, while the operational deployments to the Middle East were flowing, I, I completely get it. I, I know. I remember being in the army myself that, you know, you're, everybody wanted to get a gong and wanted to have a go, wanted to deploy on an operation, wherever that operation was. The point is that the seniors should not be worried about what the what the soldiers or the junior officers might be interested in. They should be thinking about where does the army, where does the ADF need to position itself in the future? Yeah. Uh, and now, look, I know there's we're playing a bit of catch-up these days. I know there's investments with the, you know, a one, three and seven brigades with different focuses on, 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 on different parts of the region, which is terrific. But it's from a low base, Maz, uh, and it's mm. it, it's really it's something we need to double down on. Um, in, in yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, I don't think it's a it's a secret. We all, there's also uh, the dragon to the north as well that uh, uh, you know everybody's keeping an eye on as well. And China's influence in the region is is expanding. Uh, and I think you've been quite vocal on uh, on this point as well. Uh, certainly in social media. We've been, yeah. we've been pretty good at speaking loudly and carrying a small stick. Um, mm. And uh, yeah. and I think... It should be the other way around, right? Yeah. We, we, kind yeah. of, we need to be a little bit more uh, clever. Uh, to mm. um, look, I'm, I, I think it's it's appropriate to, to stand up for ourselves. I think we need to be much more savvy about in working with our neighbours, uh, working to do so collaboratively, and also doubling down on capability enhancements. And here's, I think it's important to note that it's not just khaki, it's not just ADF coloured uniforms that are required. Um, what we're seeing uh, probably amongst China's most effective ars pieces of arsenal are its maritime militia and its coast guard. You know, they're not wearing PLA uniforms. Mm. They're operating below the threshold uh, of kinetic warfare, but they're effectively pursuing pretty adversarial policies at the expense of, it's a zero-sum game and it's at the expense of our neighbours and our friends, mm. particularly in South Asia, but also in the Pacific. Yeah, of course. Um, and I guess also if we just look at, you know, without getting into the figures, but even just the defense expenditure, say, again, US versus China, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, you can't really compare the two, but who's having the actual impact? And I think you made the point about, you know, US spending $2 trillion in, in uh, the Middle East, uh, whereas China's, uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, certainly paying dividends, whereas arguably uh, those expeditionary wars uh, have only left uh, more destruction, more problems uh, in its wake. Tragically, tragically, that's the case, yeah. And that would, see, this also begs the question about, well, what does it mean for what's going to happen in our neck, neck of the woods if, if the Americans mm -hmm. have such a patchy record, <laughs> patchy being kind, <laughs> you know, yeah. what, are, what, are, what are they going to, what kind of stunt are they going to pull in our patch? Um, and this is why I think it's so important, not that we distance ourselves from the Americans, but that we seek to influence them constructively. 
and think through the implications and to actually be a bit of, you know, one of the things struck me when I was in Washington on my post in there was the sense that we did Southeast Asia and the Pacific and because they, the, they did Northeast, North Asia, right? Mm. A little, very little consciousness of Southeast Asia and the Pacific in Washington. It's seen as our patch. And yet we, we you know, I had this chat with the CDF a few years back uh, who said to me, John, we can walk and chew gum. And I said, maybe, but barely, you know. So we, we just, we haven't been in a position to deliver for Australia's safety and security, let alone in terms of any contribution to the alliance from our investment in the neighbourhood because we have been under-investing for two decades. Yeah. And, yes, we're playing catch-up, and, yes, some good things are happening. But, as I say, low base. And I've been – you would have seen, as I've advocated a couple of times, I think we need to do much more than just the Pacific step up. I think we need to offer a grand compact to the Pacific to to – much like New Zealand's done with um, uh, with its relationships with uh, Nui and the Cook Islands, and the US has done with uh, Palau and Federated States of Micronesia, we should we should offer a deal for and and similarly in Southeast Asia, it's not the same in there because they're, 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 the dynamics are entirely different. But I think we should be looking to develop what I've called Manis, which is the Indonesian word for sweet. I'm proposing Manis as a regional maritime cooperation forum for Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Singapore. Manis, you know, and when I've mentioned it to my Indonesian counterparts, they've, it's always been very well received, but oh, nobody in Australia, nobody in Canberra in the policy world has yet sought fit to, uh, sort of seen fit to to act on it. Uh, some, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things, um, it's uh, it's got it's not a perfect idea, uh, uh, but it's it's trying to it's trying to uh, capitalise on the dynamics that we see that are, are, are the benefits accrue to Australia from our engagement through the FPDA, the Five Power Defence Arrangement, with Malaysia and Singapore. Um, but FPDA, the problem with FPDA, as you know, is it's it was it's a bit slightly anachronistic. You know, it was, it was set up initially to protect Malaysia and Singapore against Indonesia because there was a fear of a return of a confrontation-like period. Of course, those days are long gone, um, but no self-respecting Indonesian wants to join the FPDA because it was set up against them, mm. right? And it's a, a, you know, they've got the non-alliance kind of inclination that they don't want to join an arrangement like that, and it's got the Brits in there, which is which is fine for FPDA. So what I was with the Manus idea, I'm saying, look, let's leave defence formally out of the title, let's leave security out of the title, make a mean maritime regional cooperation forum, mm. right? Uh, and it's about those five countries collaborating on regional maritime security, maritime issues, security, one of them, right? So I think there's scope thus for us to do more. I know it's interesting, of course, we've seen a closer alignment of our interests with those of Indonesia than we have in a long, long time. And I think... Indonesia has Indonesia's never seen us as a threat. It's it's been miffed at us over East Timor, and it's a little bit worried about what we say, our, our rhetoric matching what we might do about Papua. Where's Papua? Uh, but I think by and large, when you when we explain, you know, when we have a chance to explain it to Indonesian counterparts, there's no way on God's earth that we are going to do in Papua what happened in East Timor. It's about 20 times as large. It's got a UN mandate. It's officially sanctioned internationally as part of Indonesia. We have no appetite remotely in actually upsetting that apple cart, and it's way more important for us to make our relationship with Indonesia work. So, uh, the, the, well, so the message there is to Indonesia, well, please make your relationship with Papua work, you know, so you yeah. don't have to worry about it. Uh, make it work. Exercise justice, you know, and 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 and... Uh, and equity, um, and uh, easier said than done, of course, because it's an ongoing strife there at the moment. But stability and security in our patch is integrally connected to the security and stability of Indonesia. And that's not something we have seen as fundamentally important in the past. 
We've seen, mm -hmm. you know, going back to the Defence of Australia days, Paul Dibbs' papers back in the 1980s, it, it was never stated, but it was kind of implicit that essentially we were looking at a confrontation-like scenario, perhaps being the, the most plausible of the least of, of the range of implausible scenarios. Now, that, as it turned out, that wasn't very plausible, but it was enough of a construct to justify the, the force structure that we had, including three brigades and the development of uh, defence-related infrastructure across the north of Australia, which actually turned out to be pretty handy when it came to East Timor in 99. So we, we just, I think uh, there's scope for us to be thinking afresh about the significance of Indonesia to us, to our security and stability, and looking at it not as an adversary, but in light of the defence strategic update, as a as a partner, a, 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 as a, a part a country that can benefit from what we can bring, and we can benefit from what they can provide as well, um, yeah. and that kind of partnership approach, a respectful partnership, uh, something we haven't given much, we haven't been all that comfortable with doing lately, uh, but I think it's I think what the, it's it's where we should be aiming heading for, you know, what we should yeah. be aiming for. I found it interesting that you mentioned. The power of rhetoric as well, or you know that our you know rhetoric might make in Indonesia question uh, our true intentions. Yeah, well, words matter; uh, they really do. Yeah, mm. and I guess my question here is, and, and I've written this one down because I, given some of the uh, comments I've seen on social media and some of the posts you, you you've made, uh, and particularly our current rhetoric, and, and I think. You know, many have referred to it as, uh, you know, beating of uh, the wars of drum, uh, uh, drums of war, sorry, um, against China. How effective is that? Uh, and what is the risk of it becoming a self fulfilling prophecy? I mean, you know, yeah. posturing ourselves in this way is that uh, productive, counterproductive, risky, dangerous? What do you think? So there's a couple of sides to this. Firstly, I think we should be clear about who's beating whose drums. Hmm. And to be fair to Mike Pozzillo, he was talking about the Chinese drums being beaten, right? It wasn't about mm. Australian drums. Australia's got little tin can drums. China's got Chinese <laughs> drums, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I... Well, that's a first realisation, yeah, right? <laughs> right? This is what I'm saying. We need to speak softly and carry a bigger stick. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, rather... But the other side to this is that I think my sense is that what Mike Pozzillo was getting at was that it's a bit of a wake-up call to Australia because we have been thinking we're spending about the right level on defence and I, I think we're having ourselves on. I think we are, uh, and it's not just defence, it's across a range of areas. And I, I touched on this in my geostrategic SWOT analysis for Australia. We, we've got we've got a range of challenges. Uh, uh, great power contestation is definitely part of it, but looming environmental catastrophe is also part of it. Uh, as well as a spectrum of governance challenges. And we're seeing that even today in Samoa, um, the talk of, you know, this pot potentially a breakdown in law and order there. Now, I'm not, uh, let's, fingers crossed, and putting in a few good words for men upstairs that will, that will work out uh, and that our diplom uh, diplomacy efforts uh, and those of New Zealand that will also help. But the bottom line is that there's a range of challenges in our neighbourhood relating to people smuggling, drug smuggling, uh, transnational criminal groups, and the undermining of law and order, particularly among some of the micro states in the Pacific, that is deeply worrying. So when you aggregate those three domains of great power contestation, looming environmental catastrophe, and then a spectrum of governance challenges, we really are undercooked in terms of how we respond. Uh, and it's not just about the ADF, it's about border force, it's about policing, it's about diplomacy, it's about aid and investment. It's a whole range of issues that we have, we've got, you know, basically in stovepipes, we've separated them out in different domains by different departmental remits with different purposes uh, that are not sufficiently uh, cross, uh, cross focused and, you know, integrated mm. yet. And we're not doing enough. Uh, you know, we've undercooked diplomacy, seriously undercooked diplomacy, and we are, we're being outplayed uh, in our own hatch. And I think we need to lift our game. And part of that, Maz, gets back to what we were saying before, is having a deeper insight into how the world in around us thinks, how they operate, uh, and not being, not just assuming that they're going to, we can mirror image and think that they'll think like we do. They don't. Mm. Mm.
And again, this uh, this point echoes also for China itself. I mean, we 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 can see what China's doing, and there's a number of uh, ways one can uh, analyze, but we certainly don't understand China as well as we think we do. Uh, no. And I think that's part of that problem as well. And, and you know, uh, one of the, my favorite comments, I'm, <laughs> I think it's worth repeating, is don't poke the dragon if you don't have to, you know. Don't poke mm. him. It's just not productive. That's, that's- What's your gut feel? Is, uh, is a... And I ask this because I've asked this uh, a number of people, and one one in particular who is a uh, chief political advisor to six four star generals in NATO, yeah. uh, whether the war with China is inevitable, and he basically laughed it off and said, "No, no, it's it's absolutely not going to happen because it is absolutely in no one's interest because of the interconnected world we live in." Uh, that it's again, you know, in, in, and I'm paraphrasing what he meant, but it's kind of mutual assured destruction again, uh, like we had during the Cold War. Uh, what's your feel on that? I, I, I hope he's right. Um, he or she is right. I don't know who you interviewed there, but uh, uh, he, uh, um, but uh, I think you can't assume that we are, are ma- going to manage to avoid it. And thinking that way, I think, is a dangerous way of thinking. We should be, in my view, thinking it's possible, and therefore working furiously to mitigate the risk of that possibility. Uh, by being very circumspect about what we say and how we engage, by keeping the doors open for constructive engagement, for mitigating the risk of uh, an American adventurism in a way that uh, is not in our interests, um, and that working closely with the neighbours, Indonesia especially, but others in the Pacific and Papua New Guinea and elsewhere, to uh, align our thoughts, align our strategies, align our approaches, to work collaboratively to foster security, stability, and maintain our prosperity. So multifaceted, multi-pronged, um, but not, I do not take for granted that the risk of war is real. Uh, I, I don't want to overplay it, and I tried to make a point in an article I wrote in the conversation recently that China doesn't want war, at least not yet. You know, it's it recognises that there are enormous negative consequences of upping the ante, uh, and it therefore is very eager to operate below the threshold of kinetic warfare uh, mm. to pursue its interests, and that we need to be mindful of that and not not try and push it over the threshold, but responding in, in a way that uh, addresses the issue at the level it's being addressed in a constructive way that looks to de-escalate, not escalate. That's easy for me to say. Doing it is incredibly hard. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you made the point about uh, about diplomacy. You know that it's been rather undercooked, and I think you know keeping those line channels, whether it's you know track one, two, three, one and a half, whatever tracks we can have uh, for negotiations. Uh, and I and I certainly hope that we do have track three, and some are calling it track four uh, diplomacy now as well. You know that 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 we haven't closed those doors because I think that would be uh, uh, detrimental. So I think you know we also need to be reasonably sanguine about all of this because. And, and, and we need to avoid exacerbating the situation. Uh, China's a big power and it's got enormous internal insecurities, um, and political uncertainty about Xi's you know, longevity uh, in power and questions about what's motivating him to and, 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 the, and the Chinese Communist Party to operate the way it does. And so we, we have to be attuned to what's happening there paying close attention, keeping options open and being as respectful as possible without compromising sovereignty. So I agree the decisions on Huawei, no question in my mind at all. Um, you know, there are there are other things that are, I, I suspect there's a domestic political angle to them which has accentuated the, uh, the, the way decisions have been made. So I'm... I'm just I'm saying we need to be very wary about not making things more difficult for ourselves than we need to. Mm. Yeah. John, you've been uh, very calm with your time. I'm just conscious we've gone over uh, over DR mark. Maybe uh one final question. 
Uh, if you could change one thing about the way we go to war, what would it be? Based on all your experience in reading and learning and, and serving. Uh, I think it's so important that that a decision to deploy troops on operations is not done by a Prime Minister on his own, but that he reaches out to Parliament for endorsement. And that process, hopefully, if it were to be implemented, would help focus the mind of the policymakers to shape a strategy that has enduring utility rather than just short-term political purpose. My concern is that we have a democratic system that focuses on the tyranny of the urgent and on the short-term political cycle. And that's not focused on intergenerational prioritisation. We have challenges, as I say, looming great power contestation, uh, environmental, looming environmental catastrophe and a spectrum of governance challenges that requires of our political leaders visionary, holistic engagement with a range of issues, not just for the next election, but for the sake of our grandkids. And mm. we're not there yet by a long shot. Yeah. And Australia is rather unique in that. I think uh, I think that was a point made, uh, again, might have been Peter Lay in the book, um, which I, chapter I really recommend. John, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been an absolutely enlightening conversation. And uh, yeah, I think a sobering one as well. Uh, I think you brought up a re- number of uh, important points for us uh, to chew on. And I hope uh, people listen to what you have to say. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Voices of War. You can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favourite podcasts. And while you're there, please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com.